My name is Alan Chilke. I uh, design roller coasters and roller coaster structure, as well as overall systems, and uh, I started my career at Aerodynamics. Perfect. Uh, tell me a little bit more about yourself. What do you do for fun? Uh, I used to be a skier big time before I worked too much. Um, so I, uh, when I graduated college, I actually went to Utah to ski. I didn't uh, go there to work on roller coasters. And uh, um, after I had been there a year and a half, um, I actually got, uh, there was a big full page ad in the local paper that says Aero is hiring you know, and they had different positions. And one of the positions they offered was junior engineer. So I figured, hey, kid out of school, junior engineer, it was meant to be. And uh, so I went up for an interview and uh, it was just a big giant mezzanine full of cubicles on the second floor and there was people just working like crazy. And uh, I had a little interview and the guy said, okay, now I want you to go over to that board over there and I want you to letter for me, you know? Like, I was gonna make drawings. And well, I went to engineering school. I mean, we had drafting classes, sure, but uh, I had no idea. And uh, I actually didn't get the job in the interview because my lettering wasn't good enough. Uh, so anyway, I, I don't know how that all worked out, but that wasn't how I got my job. That was just, uh, but that was immediately out of college, basically, when I went to Utah. How did you get the job then if you, you basically, your first time you went in and they basically said no? Uh, after that interview, um, I'd probably would say it was in the same summer, I uh, applied for a job uh, making buildings with uh, just a, a local structural engineer. And they had a lot of work at that time, um, you know, libraries, baseball stadiums, stuff like that. And we shared an office, shared a secretary with a guy who made snowmaking equipment that uh, left that job, or his whole business, to go work as a mechanical engineer at Arrow. And as soon as he got to Arrow, he noticed that they were looking for more and more people, and they didn't do their own structural engineering in-house, they hired it out. And so he got us, the, the office where I was working, uh, the job to design the structure for roller coasters. See, wow, you're really amazing. It wasn't the right path at the time, and then all of a sudden, just this whole pathway opened up and boom, there it was. Yeah, yeah, I went from, uh, we don't need guys like you because we hire those out. And so I went to the company where basically they hired out the same job that I went there to get. Tell me a bit more about your, uh, your background in terms of schooling. What did you get your degree in and, and do you have a bachelor's, master's, that sort of thing? I went to Purdue University and uh, just with a bachelor's degree. Um, basically, I was very lucky to finish. I, it took me an extra semester, so I, I graduated in four and a half years. And uh, it's a good thing that I went straight through because if I probably would have taken time off, I may not have went back. So, uh, but yeah, I, so there was no grad school in it for me. I was looking to get out of there as fast as I could. Don't blame me at all. <laughs> um, do rides still thrill you? And, and what makes a good ride to you? I still enjoy rides, um, definitely in terms of, um, not just in terms of the hands in the air and thrilling part, but just like while I'm on rides, I'm always paying attention to the mechanisms, the stuff going on, they interest me as well. So I'm, I'm interested in how it works, what makes it work, um, as well as you know enjoying the ride and having fun. Um, as far as really high thrill, uh, that's rare anymore. Um, you know, you've kind of seen it all and done it all. And uh, so now it's more, of a, it's more of an enjoyable experience and those are the kind of coasters I like are the ones that are just flat out enjoyable. Because um, sometimes the ones that shoot for the real high thrill, um, when, you, when you're kind of numb to that thrill, um, then there's not much there left, so. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your designs. Uh, just, I, you've made so many, but just sort of if you want to rattle off some of the names of the attractions that you've had a hand in or a major hand in, not only just at RMC, but back at Arrow. Uh, when, well, when I first started uh, designing structures for Arrow uh, as a consultant, um, the Blackpool big one, 
and uh, Buffalo Bills Desperado were the, really the first two projects that I got to work on um, where I was the lead. So yeah, it was kind of nice, or well, a little strange, but nice to jump into the market building the world's tallest coasters at the time. Definitely be a boom for a person you said basically just out of school still at that time, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you're the first design, I guess, that, that really is credited to you, I guess, from beginning to end, because you start with structures, uh, was Tennessee Tornado, is that right? Yeah, I had a, a hand in the track layout a little bit for the Roadrunner at Fiesta Texas. And uh, so that kind of, I don't know, I guess I don't want to say I claim that, because I don't, but, um, but that was the first one where I was really involved in the overall project and not just the structure. Tell me a little bit about that. It's considered by many to be some, one of the best arrows. It's a different type of arrow. It didn't use what was known at the time, you could call it cookie cutter elements. It was entirely new and different. Can you get, go a little more in depth about that? Well, when I got to Arrow, um, there was a lot of things that were going on there. It was kind of in the transition period. So they'd had their giant boom where they were the cat's meow and everybody wanted one and they, they built a lot of rides and, and they built them the same way for a very long time. Um, like cookie cutter elements, um, putting things together in the same order, you know, and basically there was a loop and a corkscrew and then you put the two together, you make a sidewinder. So every, every element was based on that. And uh, so when I just got there, there was a, a team of us, I'd say, that were working on how to make track a different way and how to analyze track a different way so that we weren't stuck making the same elements over. We could expand and, and do different things. And uh, that's what led to the Dollywood coaster with those were the first non-standard aero loops. So we were writing new programs uh, and new stuff to be able to generate these giant loops and, and different things easily as opposed to like because before that if somebody wanted to make a loop that was bigger than the one they made I mean they'd spend weeks you know trying to make a loop and analyzing it and we turned that into something you'd just do you know in an hour. So it was basically from the ground up you were basically recreating this entire, entire engineering process in Arrow. Yes we definitely changed uh, it started out with a little program called CVA, which is Coaster Vector Analysis. And it was the first time we actually used, I guess what I want to say, vector math and a different way to look at the ride. And we started looking at the ride basically every foot on center throughout the path as opposed to uh, a giant curve of circles and straight lines that were put together. We had a few folks talk to us at the point about uh, Magnum, how it's just a bunch of triangles. Uh, when you look at it, the you know from there with the the, the ramps and not that's ex like, so cool to hear that from the obviously another person saying yeah it's, it really is just circles and lines. Well, originally the the circles and straight lines uh, wasn't because people weren't smart enough to do better engineering. It was that's really what they were able to build in the shop, and so when they wanted to build a curve that was a thirty foot radius, they cut a big thirty foot radius board and held it up to the track and said, oh, that's not tight enough. And they bent it more and they held the board up there and said, okay, that's a 30 foot radius. And they knew they were done. And so if engineering was going to make a more complicated track layout, um, the, the fabrication wasn't ready for it either. So along with the engineering upgrade, it was a definite change in how they built track. Awesome. Uh, speaking of different types of track, uh, you had your hand in the aerobatic, correct? Yes. Uh, can you go in a little more in depth about uh, that experience? Just a little bit, what was it, the idea behind it, and, and what uh, you were planning on doing with it. We were lucky enough, by the way, to see one of the aerobatic models at SNS that they had passed uh -huh. off. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it was uh, one of the wireframe models. It, was pretty, it looked pretty amazing. Yeah, we, uh, you know, Aero had gone through its, its great times and uh, could sell things without even trying. And I got there kind of right as all that was ending. And that's kind of why the job positions were opening up. People were moving on, moving on to different companies. And uh, so we were tasked with trying to make the company a product that it could sell again. And uh, so the aerobatic was one of those. We, we, we were still making corkscrews and we were still making mine trains if we could, but uh, uh, we were looking for new avenues. So uh, Aero did mouse rides for a while. Um, that was something that I had a hand in recreating just to make it a different one, you know, the same kind of concept but different. 
And upon the heels of that is where the, we were looking for something new and that's where the aerobatic came from. And we were just trying to take a product, take it to the trade show and just get somebody to buy it, you know, just take a bite. Uh, never happened, but uh, it's a great product. It, it should have it should have flown, and I think if if the company wasn't kind of in the downturn it was when I at the time, I think it uh, could have easily taken off and and uh, turned into a you know a wide use product line. And we'll get into a bit more about that. You know, you said sort of that decline in in a little bit there. So, uh, did you have a chance to work with Ron Tumor at all? When I uh, first started, uh, Ron Tumor had. Uh, moved on to he was he uh, Larry Hayes had taken over as president and Ron was a consultant at the time, so he was still there uh, quite a bit, and I used to go down and sit in his office um, as he was, you know, trying to come up with things and do things over there and he'd uh, he'd look up at me and being a structural engineer he didn't think like that you know those guys just calculate columns. Um, he usually thought of mechanical engineers as the guys who, you know, that would come up to be a track designer and guys that knew about the cars. That was what was important. So um, it took me a while to uh, talking to him and stuff to get him to kind of, you know, not mentor me necessarily, but at least, you know, take me seriously as, uh, as the guy coming up in the company who wanted to do the work. What do you think made Aero Coasters so unique? At the time, you know, aero coasters were the, the forefront of the industry. Um, you know, other than the, the Schwarzkopf coasters certainly had their uh, time at being superior. And uh, aero at the time was uh, willing to push the envelopes. They were willing to do what uh, anybody asked and, uh, and, and to make things that uh, nobody else would, would make. Um, whether they were ready for it or not, they were they were ready to go, and they made some uh, fantastic coasters, and they made some coasters that, that had some problems and took time in the field to to perfect once uh, once they put it out there. So speaking of, of rides that they were maybe not ready to build, but you certainly were ready to build X, probably one of the most unique rides ever built. Period. Uh, still is after goodness over a decade now. Uh, Tell me a little bit about the development of X. That was your baby, if I'm not mistaken, right? From the beginning? Yeah, I actually uh, was one of those times, just for a brief period, when I was, say, 12 years old, 12 to 14 years old, uh, the Zipper was my favorite ride. I mean, I'd been to amusement parks, but I would still rather go ride the Zipper at the carnival than anything else. And so, of course, like you would think, um, gosh, sure it would be neat to have a Zipper on a roller coaster so you could go do different things. And uh, so it's one of those ideas you have as a kid, and you thought, you know, just for a brief second, hey, you know, I gotta do this or something, but that certainly goes away. You forget about things like that. And uh, never really came up in my mind that uh, this is what I was gonna do someday or I'd ever have a chance to invent this. So uh, we had gone through a period at Arrow where we had just time on our hands. We, we didn't have a lot of rides. There was enough spare parts being sold that we could uh, spend our time to come up with the next product that uh, we could sell, you know, to make something new. We had the, the same old product that, that we had wasn't uh, opening many doors, so we knew we had to come up with something, and uh, we, we called it the mystery project, project when we started, and uh, we had a whole bunch of different ideas that we were putting into it, different options and different new things to build, and uh, we had made a little clip of a car going down a straight piece of track and doing a backflip. That was just when animation started, kind of old school, uh, nothing like what you can get today in, in graphics and everything else. And uh, we made it and put it on a CD and that thing sat in my desk for another three years. Um, we had gone to uh, Cedar Point and tried to show it to them and of course they kind of looked at us and said thank you very much and you know never heard from him. there was uh, but uh, we had a meeting with Gary Story and he stopped by the the airport on a you know he flew on his jet and stopped by we had a meeting in a conference room right at the airport because he didn't have time to come over to Aero to talk to us but he had time to meet us at the airport and there were three of us in the room and we gave our he's like okay show me what you got and we showed him all the little different variations of things that we thought he might be interested in. 
Um, but really they were just the same old rides with tiny little twists. And he kind of just turned and said, I didn't come here to see this, show me what's new. And unbeknownst to anybody, it wasn't the plan or whatever, I had that CD in my backpack, pulled it out, stuck it in, and uh, that, was, that was it. He, he saw that and he said, you can really do this? And I said, yeah, we can do this. And that's what sold the project and that's what got it started. By just happenstance, just complete luck that it was just there. Wow. Yeah. Um, what makes X unique to somebody who's not a coaster enthusiast? Uh, X is the first coaster to successfully do front flips and back flips on a coaster. Um, not riding above or below the track, but out to the side. And so those were all things that were new and different. Some, of course, uh, feed off each other, but some were just things we always wanted to do, and we combined them all into the same ride. Uh, you know, just to give you a complete different experience, when we started the project, we weren't looking to build a 200 foot tall coaster. The idea was, hey, we can do something with seats that spin, and we don't need to make the biggest, giantest coaster ever. We can make something small and reasonable, and then still get the excitement out of doing something else. Um, but Gary Story wasn't interested in that. He liked the concept, but he wanted it to be huge. And so uh, we built the first prototype in the shop, and uh, that was kind of a stipulation. He said, hey, I like this. I want to go into contract for it, but I need to see a prototype. So we built one that was 20 feet tall. And all it did, it, it kind of, we hoisted it backwards with a cable, and it ran down, did a backflip, stopped, and then came back and bellied out. And uh, we were up until four in the morning, getting it done, because he was coming at eight in the morning. Broken cables, guys going down, waiting in line at the hardware store, wherever you had to buy the cable to get it back just in time. Uh, crazy experience. Uh, he showed up. Uh, him and a few others of the Six Flags team rode the prototype in the shop and we were off and running. And, uh, but when it came to placing the ride, they had picked the, the location at Magic Mountain and uh, he said, this is going to be prominent and I don't want a small coaster and it's got to be bigger than the Viper because it's going to sit out there and we're building a new ride and it's got to be bigger and that wasn't our intention for the ride, wasn't what we thought we wanted to sell. But when somebody gives you an order to sell a dream ride, um, you do what he says. So, uh, I mean, and it was. It was a, an aggressive choice. It was way too big for how you should start a new product. You should start small, work out all the kinks, get all the things done. Um, but given the opportunity, we had to take it. Uh, can a coaster be considered art? And do you design think with that in mind? I design coasters. I don't think of it as an art as in a beauty. Um, there are other people's coasters that I think are very beautiful when I look at them. Um, I consider it kind of like a, like when you compare it to uh, somebody making a crazy motorcycle. There are ones out there that are beautiful shapes and candy paint jobs and you know beautiful things with flames on them. Uh, I consider things that I make to be more of a very industrial look uh, no chrome and fancy paint, but you know, hard, ugly steel, and but you know, they have their own beauty to them in a way, um, just not not what you typically think. Gotcha. Uh, a bit now, we'll sort of shift into just a bit about what your work here at RMC. How did it come to be? How did you and Fred hook up? Um, well, we uh, working uh, as Ride Centerline um, had. Uh, done several things to work on wood coasters in the past. Um, put some braces on the Rattler to cut down on the Rattler sway. Um, and we did several things for Six Flags and they wanted to redo the coaster and were just looking for different ideas. They, they were trying to find something to fix it that wasn't a uh, standard track stack. And so Larry Chicola had a, you know, a few ideas. Magic Mountain had been working on a few ideas with putting steel in track for a long time and kind of all got together and uh, worked on the design portion of it. 
and Fred was building the construction portion of it. So he was bidding it as wood track, he was bidding it as the steel track, different combinations of making wood track better. And so it was kind of, we both won the project together. He won the installation, I won the design, and Six Flags said, hey, you know, why don't you guys, we'll just write one contract. And so why don't you guys just work together? And uh, that was kind of how it all started. What gets you excited about coming to work and, and all the long hours involved? What gets you up every morning? It's, uh, it's not what gets me up every morning, it's what keeps me up late at night. Um, it's, you know, the, the days when you can go out and uh, ride the coaster for the first time or the first coaster drop. Um, definitely the first day the public rides. I mean, those are very special days. Those are the days that make it all worth it, as they say. And uh, it's absolutely true, that, that gets you pumped for the next time. But uh, just on a daily, day in, day out basis, um, you just get in a rhythm. You kind of have to. Um, if if the, the harder I work and the more I work, um, the more I want to work. And so, because um, you know, you're doing everything from the track layout to the track design to the structure design. You've got to think about what's going on at the footing the same time you're trying to decide what fun is. Especially on these rebuilds, you can't just decide what fun is. You have to decide what fun is knowing what you have to work with and all the limitations. So um, it's interesting in terms of an engineering aspect, um, but that wouldn't do it for me. It's the, basically to be able to go out and build the world's biggest jumps. I mean, it, to me, it's the, it's the world's biggest game of follow the leader, and I'm the leader. So. I better make a good one. You know, I'm not just going to make something horrible, you know, and have all these people for the next, you know, 20, 50 years, um, you know, follow a bad leader. So uh, there's a lot to it that uh, drives you to be, I don't know, I guess I don't want to say a perfectionist because nothing's perfect, but um, it better be good because there's a lot, a lot of going into this for a lot of years and you've got your one year to do it. And uh, so it's easy to, to spend a lot of time knowing that that, I mean, it's pressure, but um, it's easy to work late and work hard to, because uh, it's important. You used to work in tubular steel. It's what Aero's famous for. Now you've perfected and working in flat steel uh, for all the rides, with either the eye box or the topper track. It's kind of ironic. Uh, tell me, with this flat steel comeback, what do you think about that? I mean, Aero basically made tubular steel because they couldn't work in the way you guys are with uh, flat steel. Yeah, I, I've, I did a, in my early uh, career at Arrow, I remember doing uh, an interview and telling people why round pipe was the only way to go. And this was, you know, this is the thing that's the ultimate. You can bend it and move it in any direction. Um, but I guess the thing with that is it's very hard to measure because engineers are, are designing the ride around the center of a pipe. And um, you can't you can't put a, a tape measure on the center of the pipe. So everything that has to do with bending and, and taking this round pipe and moving into creation is in some ways an art. It's not like super accurate. Now they've got ways now that they've gotten a lot better, but back when I was doing it, um, it was still pretty up in the air. And uh, there was no precision to it in terms of relating the shot to, the, to what was on the computer. And that's the advantage to me of um, the flat track is we are burning the shape in the table that uh, when we put these boxes together that is exactly what the engineer has designed. So it's not a matter of I come up with this great design, I give it to the shop, the guy in the shop kind of bends the steel and ends up and tweaks it to where he wants it that kind of works and it's kind of close. Um, it, it, you know what I mean? That wasn't. We, we ended up with some bumpy rides, and you know, for example, the, the the X ride was not as smooth as I wanted it to be, and so that was you know kind of the the motivation was uh, basically when I wanted to build a piece of track, I wanted that piece of track in the field because I could make an animation on the computer that would look like butter, and then you go ride your ride and you're getting tossed around a little bit. You know, this is in the 90s. Um, and so that, the motivation to figure out a new way, for me, it started back then. Um, and so it all came together with the, 
the box track um, kind of gave that, that was the motivation for me was to give me the opportunity to um, actually build my design exactly as I wanted. Uh, what parallels do you see between being at Arrow and now being at RMC? Uh, for example, Arrow was the company. I mean, for many years, they invented the stuff that everybody wanted. Now, you're here at RMC, and RMC is the company that everybody wants because they know the rides are amazing. Uh, do you see any other parallels beyond that, or do you find it I guess, sort of ironic that you're, in, although in a much different situation now, as opposed to when you got to Arrow, it sounds like it was kind of on the downward. At RMC, I mean, you've got nothing but up to go on. It's really great to be um, part of the a startup of a company, um, to take it from the ground up, and basically to invent a market. Uh, at, at Arrow, basically, um, we were following a market, a market that had been created by somebody else. Um, all those people weren't even there by the time I got there. Um, so I, I missed out on that part. And, uh, but yeah, so it's been great to be able to uh, transfer what that must have been like when that was a growing company and uh, taken over the universe to, uh, to what we're doing here at RMC and uh, maybe not taking over the universe yet, but we'll take our little bites at it at a time. Do you think without Arrow, the amusement industry would be where it is today? I think uh, the amusement industry is always going to progress. There will always be something new and there will always be people ready to do it. Um, I think Arrow just pushed it faster, you know, so we, everything that's been done, all the rides that people are creating, um, still would happen. This progression in the industry where everything has to be, you know, newer or different and big. Um, all those things that Arrow started, they did so much faster than the, that would have created. It would, I mean, we might just be, you know, we may not even have anything close to 500 foot coasters if it wasn't for Aero um, taking the leap to you know go from 100 and all the way up to 200 and plus. It's that was aggressive for its time, and uh, I think they pushed it, pushed it faster, and uh, pushed it farther. And I think everybody's following the the trend and the idea that they started. I guess there is a lot of rumors out there, or or expectations, or thoughts that people have had about why Arrow um, kind of went out of business there and bought, was bought by SNS. And uh, it really was the uh, not building the stratosphere ride. Uh, we were coming to off the heels of the fourth dimension and we needed another sale. It didn't go enough well and we know the plan was, hey, this thing's gonna go great and we're gonna sell so many right away. And uh, you know the fact that it opened late and uh, was very expensive. Um, there weren't like customers lining up to, to buy it. They did eventually, but it takes a very big park and a very special customer that's going to want to ride uh, of that magnitude. And we had uh, sold the Stratosphere ride, which was a 700 foot drop ride off the side of the tower, the giant, we call that the fish hook ride. And uh, that ride was sold. It was going in. Everything was fine. Uh, customer had signed the contract. Everything was going. And we had to get uh, city approval. And nobody was really taking it seriously at the time. We were thinking this is just a formality to go through the city. And, uh, but yeah, that would have been, I mean, the, the company was set up to build that ride. That was the ride we had. We weren't looking for any work at the time because that was a huge project and a huge undertaking. And so basically all the eggs were in that basket. And when the, the city council came back and decided that the, the structure was an icon and they didn't want a wart on the side of the tower, which was our new ride, uh, that was really the, the nail in the coffin at Arrow. What was that like when the news came out that you know that, that you, you basically you said put all those eggs in that basket? It's like, this should be simple. It's Vegas. How hard can this be? I mean, they've done everything else. And then to get that, that city council vote and they tell you no. Yeah, well, the, uh, even after the first vote, um, we just thought still, it's like, okay, the first time it went in, they didn't like it. And, uh, you know, we'll just go through some processes here and, and make sure it gets through. And so the first time it was a blow, but I guess we still didn't believe that it was, the project still wouldn't go through. And uh, 
but yeah, after time went by and I think they rejected it again. Yeah, it was devastating. It was, uh, it was a crazy time because that would have been a record-breaking ride and a totally unique thing to build. And even though everybody doesn't have 700 foot towers, there's, uh, it still would have been a ride that uh, would have been so exciting, I think. Uh, could have turned into, a, you know, nothing you're going to sell hundreds of, but uh, would have turned into a product to keep, keep Arrow going. Would Arrow still be around today with the competition that's around from like you've got a Zaire now, you've got Gerslauer, uh, B&M still continuing to make uh, rides. Uh, you know, if all things in a, a strange, think about that scenario, could Arrow still compete today if it was still around? Arrow was, uh, at the time I was there, it was, uh, you know, morphing into something new every couple of years. And, uh, so I don't, there's no reason why, if, if we could have made it through the, the financial times there with the loss of the, the ride that we were banking on, um, uh, it certainly could have kept going, turned into something new, uh, turned into new rides, could have been the aerobatic, um, and uh, it was well positioned to uh, keep bringing in new people and keep coming up with new rides, and there's no reason it uh, couldn't be around today. It's just the way it uh, turned out. And, uh, uh, you know, it's still part of SNS. It's still a, a good part of the organization there, um, but uh, it's not the same as it was. You know, remaining the arrow of yesterday. I guess I wouldn't compare it to being any kind of celebrity at all. It's uh, it's nice though that uh, people recognize the rides that I've done. They like it, um, and to me, it's not. It's super important that everybody loves my rides. I mean, I read all the blogs and stuff. I see what people say about them. Some things are horrible. Some things are great. And uh, but I know I can't win everybody over or have everybody love my ride or be the favorite. But it's important for me that every ride that I build that it's somebody's favorite. So um, I think that's the big thing is to be able to build rides that people love. And uh, when somebody can say it's their favorite ride, even if it's a smaller ride. Um, at least you get some of the locals that haven't been around the world to the, see all these things. Hey, as long as somebody comes to me and says, hey, this is my favorite ride, uh, that's what makes my day every time I build one. This is the big one. This is the one that uh, has stumped a lot of people, uh, just so you know. So take your time on this one. What do you feel is Arrow's ultimate legacy, not only on the industry, but in the world and to the general public? What do you think that legacy is? What will it be if there is a legacy? I think really everything that uh, Arrow did at the time was show people that the boundaries could be pushed. Um, to go from when coasters were 80 feet tall, you know, max, uh, and, and do new things. I mean, do the corkscrews, do the, I mean, basically, uh, new companies can come up with new rides and new things, but, but Arrow was really the company that started it all in terms of showing people that that's what you need. That's what a company needs to be. If you're going to go out, I mean, you can be a me too company and try to beat people on price, but if you're really going to go out in the industry and, and, and grow a company and make it into something special, um, you have to come up with something new and something different, and you have to be able to push all boundaries of what's known and create something that nobody's ever seen. And really, that's, I think that's what Arrow showed everybody, is that not only that that's what it takes, but uh, that's what sells, that's what people want, that's what the world wants. They want to see something that nobody's ever done before. And uh, they did it best, I mean, in terms of being the pioneers, to be the first people that consistently built stuff that was way too big and, you know, for the time, way, you know, just huge stuff. Um, it really set the set the goal in terms of what these other companies have to follow and to know that if you're going to make a mark in this industry, you've got to do something spectacular like they did. You can't just build more coasters.